Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. This is my Consul in the spotlight is Lisa Barr, the author of the just released Woman on Fire novel. And there's just a lot of excitement around this book. It's getting, um, I guess, Good Morning America just this morning made it one of their picks. We're going to talk to Lisa about that. Sharon Stone, the famous actress, has optioned the movie and she's planning to produce and star in it. And um, this is Lisa's third novel. She also wrote a novel called The Unbreakables and another one before that called Fugitive Colors. And uh, her life has uh, pretty much exploded these days. Lisa, welcome to the program. Oh, so great to be here, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. You know, people who dream of writing books, dream of writing novels, people who listen to this podcast, they dream of what you're going through right now, where here's a book that's created a lot of excitement, uh, a major... A uh, Hollywood star has optioned your film, was looking to make it into a major motion picture. Did you have any sense at all when you were, when you came up with the concept for the book and you were writing it, do you have any sense that this book was going to uh, be something special? Um, at the great question. I wrote this book during COVID and I sort of decided I wanted to put everything I love into the book. So it's suspense, it's history, you know, it, there's sex, there's, you know, risky journalistic pursuits and strong, fiery women. I knew if I was going to be locked down, I wanted to really enjoy the characters I was going to be hang, hanging out with. And um, so I just wrote it without those thoughts, but I really have to say I gave it everything I had in this book. So you are ex really women oriented. Your main character, your protagonists are women. Uh, you uh, have served as an editor and creator of a popular parenting blog called Guerrilla Warfare, Girl Guerrilla <laughs> yeah. Warfare, as in girl, yeah. a mom's guide to surviving the suburban jungle. You wrote an article called Being Left Out Hurts, Moms Stop, en Stop Social Engineering. That went viral and was read or shared by about 5 million readers nationwide. You've been featured on, on the Today Show, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, and the Australia TV, uh, Australia TV for, for the work that you've done. So and, you know, the thing that keeps coming up uh, repeatedly when I read um, some of the summaries of your books is sex. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit a little later because I'm really interested in uh, how a woman approaches a sex scene versus a man. We know some very famous authors, of course, men, authors who have been roundly criticized as objectifying women and all. Uh, women don't run into that those kind of criticisms so much. But before we get to that, that's just a little foreshadowing for our audience. <laughs> what about Sharon Stone? Did she get directly in touch with you? Did you have a conversation with her? Can you tell us a little bit about how that all came together? Oh, yeah. No, I would love to. And I, I wanted to add one pertinent back to the list of things I've been involved with, with women. And it's, I have three daughters. So I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we jokingly call our house, um, you know, Casa Sephora or Drama Central. So I've got a <laughs> lot of, I, we've got a lot of estrogen going on in this place. Um, <laughs> and my dog is a girl, but um, yes. Yeah, so I wrote this book and I had read Sharon's amazing memoir called The Beauty of Living Twice. And I was just blown away. You know, you really got a behind the scenes look at, you know, what made this woman an icon and all the things she had to fight for, fight up, you know, fight against. And she's really incredible. So I had read this book and the hard, you know, the, it came out, I don't know, maybe a, a, a year and a half ago or something like that. And then uh, I had received this blurb from one of my writer friends, Kristen Harmel, and in the blurb, she described Woman on Fire as spotlight meets woman on gold meets basic instinct. And so I thought to myself, yes, my God, that's exactly right. And so I took the ARC, which is the advanced reader's copy before it became a book, and I thought, you know, what the hell? I'm just going to send it to her business office. You know, she'll probably never see it. And then... 
uh, you know, maybe it was a month later and my husband and I are sitting on the couch watching Netflix and all of a sudden I get a text from Sharon saying, hi, this is Sharon Stone. I'm, you know, she gave me where she was and she said, I'm reading your book and loving it. And from that point on, you know, things moved really quickly and I was, you know, obviously in shock and excited. And um, so, yes, so we, you know, signed a contract together around Christmas time and it was announced, you know, a few weeks ago. And she is lovely and strong and smart and I'm could not be more excited about this. It's just, it was the right person. You know, it was just almost a meeting of minds. So yeah, this is happening. It's crazy. Well, you know, so often a book or a script will get optioned and and the author gets paid money, but but more often than not, it never gets made. This one sounds like she's drawn a beat on this character. She really wants to play the character. Is that the case? Do you feel that this this is one that's that stands a really good chance of actually getting made? I mean, I'm a really positive person, and I like to put that energy out in the world. So I'm going to say yes, but I, I do agree with what you said that a lot of um, things get optioned, and it just you know for whatever the circumstances, it doesn't it doesn't happen. But I feel like. This one just has the energy and the vibe and it's, you know, and the and it's a woman versus woman showdown, two very strong women. And it's really right for the times right now. So I think I'm gonna say yes. Now your protagonist is uh let me see if I pronounce this correctly, Margot de Laurent. Is that correct? Yes. So I have there's there's two in in effect. There's Jules Roth, who's a 24-year-old um, journalist, and she comes up against uh, this ruthless gallerist, Margot de Laurent. And so, um, very, you know, just as a side note, I was a journalist for about 25 years, and so it was really fun for me to write, put myself back when I was a young journalist and idealistic and would take any story, you know, now I'm old and crusty and jaded, you know, so everything, everything has changed, but it was so fun for me to go back there and sort of take her on the journey. You know, she's obviously going to learn things. And, you know, the basic storyline is she's, she's, um, gets embroiled in a major international art scandal centered around a Nazi looted painting. So she has to decide is chasing the story going to be worth her life? And so, you know, back in the day, years ago, I would say for myself, oh, yes, I, it's worth it. You know, now I'm a mom and, you know, life got in the way and you make different decisions. But it was fun to be Jules and actually even more fun to write my evil character, um, Margot de Laurent. And um, yeah, so it's a woman versus woman showdown. And, uh, Who would Sharon Stone play? Would she be the journalist then? Well, you know what? Um, I am not going to discuss any of those details uh-huh. if you're okay with that, Mike. <laughs> but um, you know, that's that's all still being discussed and decided. But uh, you know, my, my guess is she's going to play the bad girl. You know, uh, she, I think she likes playing a bad girl. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's my yeah, prediction. You're trying to get me to say something here, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you predict away. But she's uh, we're well, you know. That's still being decided, but there's definitely, uh, you know, uh, exciting parts in this book for women to play. And I have some great male characters as well that I loved writing. So, yeah, this is I'm, I'm hoping this sees the big screen. So just to flesh out your your journalistic uh, creds a little bit, you you got your master's degree at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, one of the best known journalism schools in the country. You wrote for the Jerusalem, you're editor and reporter for the Jerusalem Post. You were an editor and reporter at the Chicago Sun-Times. You covered uh, the famous uh, handshake between Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and the late uh, PLO uh, leader Yasser Arafat and, and Bill Clinton at the White House, 1993. Um, now, Woman, Woman on Fire, here you've got one of your main characters being a journalist. And Woman on Fire, you've got, this is the tale about young, ambitious journalist. Sounds like a little bit autobiographical. Uh, gets embroiled in an international art scandal that's centered around a Nazi looted masterpiece, uh, which forces the ultimate showdown between as as the um, 
summary says here, the ultimate showdown between passion and possession, lovers and liars, history and truth. It sounds like, uh, you know, a complex, a complex tale. Uh, as I was saying, the book has just been released and uh, um, it's it's out there now. Where did this idea come from? I hate to even ask that question because, but I, you know, there have been uh, so many movies around uh, Nazi Germany around World War II and all. Uh, did you ever watch anything that served as kind of the the kindling for this idea? Yeah, no. See, I love that question because I come from a journalistic background, and you know, with all my books, I, usually there's a news hook that gets me going, and that's what I you know gravitate toward. So, in this particular book, in 2012, there was um, what's called the Munich Art Horde, and it was the biggest art story to rock the art world. And what it was, uh, they found in Munich in an old rundown apartment, 1500 masterpieces, literally uh, stuck in a this old man's stove, his his cabinet. And we're talking, you know, um, Matisse, Chagall, Picasso. And it turns out that he was the reclusive son of Hitler's art thief, Hildebrand Gerlitt. And when I, and there's lots of shocking details to this story. And when I read this, I literally could feel the blood moving beneath my skin. And I'm like, yes, this is my story. And so without giving away any spoilers, the book begins there. And basically the ruthless art dealer is robbing the robber. And so is that a crime? And basically uh, it takes off from there and everyone has a vested interest in this masterpiece, which is called Woman on Fire. And um, so, yes, that was the inspiration for sure, that story. Wow. Okay. Now, uh, as I was saying, you have two other novels. One's called The Unbreakables, a novel about a, a it sounds exciting also, a woman uh, who jets off to France after her perfect marriage collapses. Uh, she's trying to put the, together the broken pieces uh, of her of her uh, psyche. And uh, while well, she's rediscovering her, her joie de vivre, of her lust for life and art and steamy sex. There's that, yeah. there's that three letter word again. And then you also have one called Fugitive Colors, which um, really asks the question, how far would you go uh, for your passion? Would you kill for it, steal for it, go to any lanes to protect it? This is Hitler's war again. So we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, you, you definitely have a streak of, uh, of history. You like Europe, it sounds like, in, yeah. in your, and you like history. So uh, there you have that. Um, I don't remember whether I asked you to be prepared to read a little excerpt from um, Woman on Fire, or is it at hand to where you could read uh, maybe a couple minutes from it that's emblematic um, of the novel? Yes, let me um, let me take a look at that. Let's see. Um, okay, this is going to be on the fly, so I will I will just read you something here. Sure. I suppose you're not writing now because you're too busy doing yeah, promotion. Yeah, I'm, I'm running around on on book tour. Um, so let's see. I will read this here. So um, this is a scene where Margot. Uh, it's it starts at Art Basel, and Margot uh, Dilarant is she's kind of running the show, and she's about to showcase the painting woman on fire. And she says, good evening and welcome, Margot begins. I'm Margot de Laurent, and I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight. She doesn't need a microphone. Her rich voice resonates, her British accent posh and well-heeled, reflecting her privileged upbringing. This is DLG, G's 18th year presenting at Art Basel. Tonight's showcase is particularly important to me because it's more than just an exhibit. It's personal. She gestures toward the large covered canvas perched behind her and everyone's gaze follows. She has her audience in the palm of her hand. This painting has been missing from our family collection for eight decades until now. There is a pregnant pause as Margot makes a panoramic sweep of the packed house, then turns to her assistant standing near her dressed in head to toe black. Unveil it, she says. The drape comes off in one dramatic swoop and Jules gazes up in awe at the enormous canvas. And then a shockwave hits her, as though she walked into a restaurant and a surprise party were waiting for her on the other side of the door. 
She may be imagining it, but Margot smiles directly at her from the podium, a mercurial grin that quickly dissolves into a sneer. Jules's blood thumps, her anger mounts. That painting does not belong to her. Liar, Jules screams at the top of her lungs, but no actual sound emerges. Her voice is hollow. Perspiration slides down the back to her designer dress. This can't be happening, but it is. The clapping is random at first, and then a resounding ovation breaks out, deafening like the winning goal in a World Cup game. Jules's face burns, yet her hands are cold as though her body temperature is malfunctioning, realizing that she is the one who has been played. Margot revels in the applause. Her hard gaze finds Jules once again. Her ice smile is no longer a mere victory lap. It's a screw you with a cherry on top. Jules sees Adam trying to push through the packed house and make his way toward her. But she, before she can react, she feels a hard rap on her shoulder and follows the finger. A sharp-faced young woman stands before her in a white leather mini dress, so tight that it would take a scraper to get it off. Jules recognizes her as the door girl who stood at the mansion's entrance, marking off the guest list, which clearly isn't her day job. Follow me, the woman commands under her breath, as in now. Jules' legs no longer seem to hold up. Her gaze shoots to the other side of the room, searching for Adam, but he's gone. Where? Her head is spinning. Think, think. Her gut warns her to run like hell, but the bigger part of her knows that she'd better do as she is told. The or else looms over her head like a black cloud. Jules follows the woman out of the courtyard, through a discreet side door, down a short, narrow staircase, and into the unknown. Before she can see what's happening or revise her decision, Jules's purse is snatched, and she is pushed roughly into the back seat of a waiting vehicle by a firm, needy hand. She turns briefly, and through the car's tinted rear window, she spots the door girl, standing at the zigzag shadows of a lit-up palm tree in the distance. Suddenly, without warning, a hood is placed tightly over Jules's head and her hands are tied. The air leaves her lungs and it feels like her head is departing from her body as the car accelerates. She braces herself against the sticky leather seat. Why didn't she leave or run or scream when she had the chance? Is the damn painting worth her life and those of the people she loves? I love it. It sounds like lots of sumptuous types of environments and ostentatious behavior by your characters. I mean, I can I can see it. I can I can already uh, see that. Now, you know, the journalist Jules, um, I'm sure, has modeled somewhat after you. I mean, you you have a lot of journalistic personal experiences. Obviously, uh, was the uh, was uh, Margot uh, modeled after anybody at all, or was she a composite character? Was she kind of a Leona Helmsley type, but 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 France based or something along those lines? Yeah. How did I've, you kind of create her? Yeah. No, that's a great question. So, yes, Jules was a lot of me. And Margot was a composite. I had a little bit of Ghislaine Maxwell in there, you know, um, oh, just yeah. uh, sort of a ruthless sociopath. But as we all know, as every writer knows, that if you have an evil, quote, unquote, evil character, they're never really good unless there's a part of them that is good or com or that you can empathize with as the reader. So Margot, as bad as she is, has one tender soft spot, and that is uh, connected to the painting. Now, this painting um, again. It, what is this a, uh, a painting, a privately owned painting, or did this come from a museum? Was this a, a stolen piece of art? So uh, this painting is, you know, oh, it was looted. You said by the Nazis. Yes. So this was. Uh, an artist, again, fictional, but a composite of other artists. His name is Ernst Engel, and he was the leading expressionist of the time. And basically, he was murdered by the Nazis. The Nazis went after the avant-garde, you know, with a vengeance never seen before uh, in terms of the art history. And um, so he was an expressionist painter, the leader, as I said, of the movement. And this was the very last uh work of his before he was murdered. So it was a masterpiece and um, very valuable. And uh, yeah. Do you assign a value to it, a financial value in the book or is it? I, I, there is sort of, of 
Yeah, no, there. It's about a hundred million dollar value in the book, and, and you know, and at different times, obviously, the price goes up, up and down with that. But that's the value of this of this piece. So, uh, talk about writing sex scenes. Uh, as as a woman, I think women approach it differently. What's your uh, kind of mo in terms of a sex scene? Is it is it really to titillate the audience or is it to develop a character? Is it to, is it a bridge to somewhere else, kind of a transition uh, to somewhere else in the story? How do, how do you regard uh, sex scenes? Do you have any philosophy around yeah. it or do you go with what you feel? I, I, you, you hit it on the nose actually. So I do have a philosophy. I really enjoy writing sex scenes because it's not about the sex, you know, obviously, you know, physically, you know, it's, you have to create a, a good and, you know, enticing sex scene. But what's really important is how does that sex scene move the character, move the plot along? What is that person thinking? What's happening with the other person at the same time? So it's really um, a great sex scene is everything around the sex and, wh- and how this pushes the story forward. Because for me, when you write a sex scene, it's, whoever's involved in the scenario, their most intimate and vulnerable, uh, you know, position as a character. And so I actually really enjoy getting inside a character's, you know, psyche and, and move the story along through a good sex scene. Mm-hmm. And sex scenes are always, I mean, people are always vulnerable in sex scenes. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, there, there's a tremendous vulnerability yeah. there because it's, it's, it's not the sort of thing that uh, happens all the time. And you, and you know, you don't entrust everybody um, with, with that kind of a situation. Um, so, and, and then I, I would imagine a lot of representational language so that you don't have to be overt in describing what's happening, but uh, no, a I, lot of I maybe don't have a problem metaphors. With- I, I don't have a problem with being overt. Um, you know, I know my middle book, The Unbreakables, is very sexy. And, um, you know, obviously my husband got a lot of teasing about it. And I, I just, I do want to say something that's actually kind of funny. But my my husband reads, you know, I go over all my chapters with him and he reads through my books. But he will not read. He skips over any sex scene in my book. He just does not want to know. And he said because he doesn't want to know what his mother is reading. So that is that's that's where he comes from. But so it's or what you've stolen from him. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So who are some of the um, uh, writers who influenced you? Gosh, I there's so many, and I have so many in uh, you know in contemporary times. But you know, a lot of people are my friends, and so I'm just going to pick a few. You know, I love D. H. Lawrence, um, Erica Zhang, Fear of Flying. Um, these are I'm going to tell you what's actually on my nightstand, and that comes with me wherever I go. So it's um, Erica Zhang, Fear of Flying, Essie Hinton's uh, The Outsiders, and I had every Nancy Drew book growing up. I mean, the entire series. And that was really, as a a young girl, how I, you know, my love of suspense and writing suspense and probably what really was a catapult for me to become a journalist. So I would say, and Judy Bloom, of course, Mm. uh, major, major influence on my work. You know, um, I have to tell you, the sexiest book I ever read, you may have read it too, is Henry and June by Aeneas oh, Nain. amazing book. Yes, love yeah, it. Yeah, I, I mean, just front to back. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, it it just steam comes off of it. And uh, to, I mean, who better to to write it than a, than a woman if you're a man reading it? Uh, yeah. I, I much prefer <laughs> a woman writing the sex scene than a man. There's something a little uh, odd about that for me. Um, tell me what you would advise... Uh, for for the aspiring writers out there who again dream of uh, um, uh, reaching the stage that you're at right now, what kind of advice do you give aspiring authors for uh, getting their work completed and hopefully published and and, and sold? I've, well, you know, I have. It's funny because I had a big book event last night, and there was a young woman there, and she wants to be a writer and get into publishing. And I was telling a story that I had a very uh, big interview right after the assassin, assassination of Yitzhak Rabin uh, in, in Jerusalem with his widow. And basically, I had my high-tech, amazing tape recorder. And what happened was it picked up all the air conditioning so that it's basically the inst- interview was wiped out. 
but I had my trusty, crappy old high school report uh, recorder with me, and that picked up the whole interview. So my point is to every young writer, I always say have a backup and back up the backup. That's for sure. Um, I think it's really hard. Uh, you have to be able to take rejection, and writers can be the most sensitive people in the world, so it's hard. This is an industry filled with rejection because books are personal. You might love something, and your best bud is not going to like the same book you just liked. Uh, so, you know, writing is very personal. So, you have to be able to handle the rejections. And um, the other important thing is. Um, is finding a community. And, you know, there's so many Facebook salons or Instagram that you can join in. Writing can be super lonely. And you're, it's just you and your computer. Really important to, even if it's just one person, have a writing buddy. And it, it really changes the dynamic and it really helps you as a writer. So find a community. And, you know, just if this is your love, if you have to write, no matter what, like I did, uh, you have to just follow your passion. And, you know, it, it might be a long road. You might be an overnight sensation. Everyone's got a different story. But you will get there if you stick to what's in your heart. Do you already have your next novel in mind? Do you know what I, you're going to write next? I, I, I have been working on it. You know, as you had mentioned, I'm, I'm now, you know, knee deep in book tour and uh, promotion leg of everything. But um, for some reason, I always gravitate right back to World War II. So this one that I'm working on, my work in progress, is about a an actress and in the background, she has a secret past that connects to World War II. What is your favorite? Uh, do you have a favorite? Uh, oh, you have a favorite? Yes, uh, my dog. Blog. <laughs> do you have a favorite uh, uh, World War II movie or book that uh, that, I, that you favor? Uh, do I have a favorite World War II book? Um, I or yes, movie. yes, I love. Um, oh gosh, uh, uh, Myla eighteen. I I love. Um, you know, uh, Leon Uris books. Uh, Joseph Heller. You're getting, my dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. The, this is the life of being at home. Uh, um, here she is. It won't, bother, it won't bother us. It won't bother us. Yeah. Uh, funny story, totally off topic, but I read my books, um, the manuscript aloud, every word of it to my dog. Uh, FYI, she's my dog whisperer for everything I do. <laughs> Does she so, react at all or just? Yeah, her, she her loves <laughs> everything I write. So I, I'm sure she just. You noise count on a dog. They're yeah, so loyal. Exactly. But yeah, so I, there's so many brilliant World War II authors. Um, Pam Jenoff <laughs> is, is someone recent uh, who uh, is a fabulous writer of World War II fiction, um, historical fiction. I mean, there's so many. Kate Quinn, uh, there's, I, I love a lot of the contemporary writers of World War II. And interestingly, a lot of them are women, and I love that too. Now, um, what is your process? Uh, when you go back, when, you're, when your touring is done, and you're done with the book promotion, uh, what is your normal process in terms of uh, how many hours you write, how you approach it, what time of day, yeah. et cetera. So I'm a morning person, but, you know, I have to say, <clears throat> you know, all my mom writers who have young kids, it's a lot harder. And I've been there, you know, with your constantly looking for stolen time, you know, uh, that 20 minutes where they're watching a, a cartoon or something, you use it to write. But now m my girls are all, you know, out of the house. So I really write seven days a week, probably 10 hours a day. I'm wow. doing something book oriented. I, I, I work hard. I work a lot. Um, do you I, have know, a designated room that you write in? I, or do you, you know, move around? I'm a, I'm a cafe writer. So I have a, my favorite cafe. I, I have to get out of the house because when you're in the house, you have always have laundry looking at you or anything else related to your house. So I, I do have a, a, an office in my home. But I try to get out and be and write in a cafe where I'm around people. There's airborne conversation. I do have a writing buddy and we meet, which is lovely. Um, but uh, I, I really try to do something every day. And that is also my advice to young writers. Sometimes get up early, start your day, get your coffee, whatever you need to get going, 
and then start writing because sometimes those early hours, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a 5.30, 6am person, uh, is they're just the most productive time of day to write, I find for myself. And, and you get it out of the way before your day gets away yeah, from you that, because that's you never know too. what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm the same. I'm not, I don't even consider myself a, really an early. I don't. I love getting up early, but I'm not sure that's my, my most creative time of day. But just getting it done so that it's um, because, again, uh, the day can get away. Now, you uh, observe the maxim to read what you write out loud. What does it sound like when you read it out loud? So um, because our internally, our internal ear tends to smooth everything out. So when you read it out loud, what do you sometimes find that you don't like? Oh, um, I think reading out loud uh, is is essential because you hear dialogue, you hear it. And so when you write it, you know, there's just a different perception of, of what you're reading. And once you hear it, you really can see, oh, my God, I'm, I'm just going off on this description. I'm finding it boring. The reader is going to be bored. So I immediately hear where to cut and, and you know, where to revise. Um, also, you can hear words that you will see on page 25 and you'll see it again on 75 and you hear it. And you, you also find funny things. It's a joke among writers. Uh, you know, someone will say, my character yawned like 85 times in my book. Mine will be, you know, when he looked at me, you know, with this gleam in his eye, you know, 50 times. And you know you have to shift and revise that. So I would highly recommend reading it aloud, it aloud because it's a whole different uh, story. And don't you sometimes trip over a sentence and then and then think to yourself, is this sentence, should it be constructed differently so that it reads more smoothly? Do you, yes. do you find and that as well? A hundred percent. If something is chunky, it's chunky and you need to streamline it. I think my training as a journalist has really um, helped to that because, you know, in journalism, it's who, what, where, when, why and how. And you have to get that out in the beginning. No adjectives, just the story. And so when you're writing fiction, you get to keep all the adjectives, but you also learn, you know, um, you, I have learned, I should say, um, what can go and, you know, what can be wordy and, and not be afraid as, you know, they say to, you know, get rid of your, or kill your darlings, as they say, mm. to let it go. You know, uh, as a journalist, uh, I think all journalists go through this where, we struggle with with having to put the facts together. It's it's not just uh, collecting facts is one thing, then actually writing a story in a way where they are all assembled um, in a logical and smooth fashion. It can it's it's hard work. It's frust all writing is hard work, but yeah. it's frustrating. And I think we we always pretty much any journalist dreams of being able just to write what they're feeling rather than worry about the facts. You're actually manufacturing characters and scenes and all that. Is that part of what motivated you to um, step out of journalism and go to, into the fiction writing world? So I was sort of a hybrid human. I would say I was a journalist by day and I'd work on my fiction at night. And um, I mean, I, I, I and loved, did you do that all along, like from the beginning of I, your career? I did. Really? I did it all along. And then I think once, you know, my novel started, you know, the first one really took off, um, you know, I, I just, I didn't have the time to do both. I, you know, especially being a mom, three girls, you know, lots of drama. I had so much going on in my personal life that I had to sort of pick and choose. And I think writing books is, you know, that's always been my dream. And I chose that. But um, as I'm promoting the book, I've been asked to write various essays or contribute. And so I kind of get my journalistic groove back here and there. But, you know, obviously not the same, you know, uh, a daily reporter where you have that adrenaline, you start with a story, you're racing, running, interviewing, running back to the, you know, newsroom, turning it in and, you know, only breathing at five o'clock when, our, you know, it's done and out, you know, and there's an excitement to that for sure. Um, and an instant gratification aspect, you know, whereas a book is a lot longer to see the light and to see it in the light. And um, so I, 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 I don't think I've really let go of my journalistic uh, you know, background and and my love for it, but I've really been much more book focused uh, in the last couple years. 
I know you only have a few more minutes, Lisa. So um, one more question. Sure. How long did Woman on Fire take you to write? So I would say I really got it out in about nine months. And just as a comparison, my first book was over a 10-year period. You know, that's between kids and moving and life. Um, I had sort of... Um, really being locked down. And as I said, my kids are older and I, I did have my eldest daughter working across the kitchen table with me during COVID, which was wonderful. But I really um, knocked out the book, I would say in nine months. I gave birth to it in nine months. Wow. Wow. That, that's pretty fast. So you obviously uh, were, were inspired. Well, Lisa, congratulations. I'm excited about getting my hands on the book now that it's out and also seeing the movie. I hope uh, it comes out quickly and looking forward to Sharon Stone's performance and that. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for oh, joining us. Mike, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here and such great questions. And I really appreciate it. Uh, and so enjoy the book and uh, enjoy the day.